Do you want to hear the whole thing? I do. <laughs> it was a summer romance gone crazy. Fell in love twice, first with him and then with Alaska, and one thing led to another. Marcy and I enjoy working hard, and we enjoy <laughs> beer, and we started thinking maybe we should uh, work together. A friend of ours, as a joke, said, you ought to start a brewery. Starting a brewery in Alaska, it became an obsession, and we started in 1986. When Jeff and Marcy set out to brew a true Alaskan beer, there were maybe only a hundred breweries across America, and that's counting the big guys. There were no breweries in Alaska at the time. There was really old beer up here because, of course, everybody shipped everything from down south up that they didn't want. But were we going to ship it back? Jeff was home brewing too, so he was playing with flavor. What could we do to make a fresh, flavorful beer here? We are all so connected up here in Alaska that. To us, Alaska is our community, and Alaskan Brewing Company just has been an incredible dream come true. I don't know where else a young couple in their 20s with zero experience in brewing, zero experience in business, little to no money, <laughs> would find people to back us and support us and get us going. We had 88 investors to start with, stretching all the way from Kotzebue to Ketchikan, the entire state. We told everybody, you may lose every dime you put in this. Everybody was like, okay, but we want to see something happen. We want to see it stay in Alaska. We want to see an Alaskan entity. And the best thing is, is that group of 88 investors, many of them are still with us or their kids are with us. All of them are supportive of not only the brewery, but how we support our crew, how we now have an employee stock ownership program. They're not out to make a ton of money. They're just out to see something, make it be successful and bring good to the economy of Alaska. Sustainability means to be able to survive economically. So you have to be able to financially make it, but to also not negatively impact where you are. So what are you doing that you can keep the economy, keep the people, keep the environment all healthy, wealthy, and alive? We are thrust in one of the most beautiful places in the world. The oceans are right up against mountains and whales are jumping and fish are on the table that you got. We go to places that are pretty wild. The only footprints on the beach are the bears and maybe ours, but there's still trash and it's from the ocean. We take 1% uh, of our gross proceeds from our IPA and donate it to anybody who has anything to do with any watershed. Beach community cleanups or river cleanups or whatever. I don't care if you're landlocked in, in Utah or landlocked in Missouri. Because everything flows to the ocean. And Alaska has the largest coastline of any state in the like Union. 6,500 miles or something, right? Is that possible? I haven't counted them. I tried to walk a few yeah. of them, but I haven't, yeah. <laughs> I haven't gotten them all. We have plenty of water here. That's, that's not an issue for us. It's glacial water. The local glacier, Mendenhall Glacier, it comes out of the Juneau ice field. That ice has been there for hundreds of thousands of years at least. But it feels like, you know, we have a couple guys out with uh, chisels and lighters on the glacier, you know. Juneau's on the mainland, but it, it's effectively an island. We have roads, but they don't go to any other town. So everything comes in either on an airplane or on the barge. If you're down in Portland or something and you run out of hops, you just go down the street and get some, right? Like we, we have a five-day supply chain at a minimum. We do think outside the box because we are outside the box. <laughs> and so whether it be the challenges of a location, which induced us to capture our CO2, carbon dioxide, we were the first craft brewery to do that in, in the United States or in the world. But that was because we had to. And normally breweries just blow that off into the atmosphere. And those same breweries turn around and buy CO2 for packaging and other aspects of production. Well, down south, CO2 is cheap, 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 cheap. No problem, no problem. Up here, you gotta ship CO2 up. So that made us start looking into it. How can we do this for A, we're better for the environment if we capture it, and B, economically, it's gonna pay off. Their solution did pay off, and every year, they save a million tons of CO2 emissions. Because we've had to innovate so much from where we are, there's a lot of processes here that uh, we were the first to do. The biomass boiler. We're gonna move over to the, the biomass system. We use our own waste stream to create our beer. They call it beer-powered beer, and they're saving 65,000 gallons of diesel a year. We've always been conscious of our waste because Juno doesn't have a huge landfill, so we really need to deal <laughs> with all of our waste. And while the grain left over for brewing can feed farm animals or fertilize soil, 
There isn't much agriculture in Alaska. Yeah, we have a couple cows, a couple chickens, a lot of bears, a lot of deer. <laughs> But the they're not going to eat the, the amount of grain that we produce. What we did is we dried it and shipped it to a farm down in Lower 48. Wow. But that's a thousand mile journey. In the process of drying that grain, they realized they could burn it instead to power their brewing. If it was easy, we'd go the easy route. It's a high protein waste product that's difficult to burn. We didn't have an option. Right. In my mind. So in many ways, our environment makes us do what we do. The uh, mash press was the next thing, and that was once again saving water, saving waste grain, not using as much. A key part of making beer is mashing, steeping grains in hot water to convert starch into sugar. Mashing is traditionally done in a machine that functions like a giant drip coffee maker. At the end, the sugary liquid is sent on to fermentation, the spent grains are removed, and you rinse out that giant machine with a lot of water every single time. We have embraced a mash filter press, which is like an espresso machine. It actually presses out all of the goodness. We use less water. By less water, we're talking two million gallons a year. And they use 6% less grain, which means less waste to deal with. We use less energy to dry the grain, which ends up becoming our fuel. When you can turn your waste into fuel, and you don't have to use diesel, and it doesn't get any better than that. There's a lot of folks down in the lower 48, they're now looking into something like that for sustainability reasons. It wasn't just one wizard or Jeff thinking it up, and he will tell you that too, I'm sure. It was, it was our entire crew all having bits and pieces in. Hey, what about this? Could we do this? Could we do that? We have a great team. The team really does enjoy what they do. It's hard work, there's no question about that. The fanciful notion of, of a brewery and working in a brewery is pretty cool but there's a lot of hard work. This is our one barrel pilot brew house where we do our, our single batch brewing. We'll experiment and then graduate our beers up. We form little groups of brewers and accounting staff and salespeople and they're tasked to play, allowing everyone to kind of participate in expressing themselves yes. in the liquid form. It's pretty fun as a brewer to have your beer move up through the ranks and, and move into production. Cheers. Cheers. The Alaskan Amber, our first beer, was actually a, a throwback to 100 years prior to our starting. They recreated the recipe from Juno's first brewmaster with... Invoices of what the brewery had purchased as far as the malt bills, and then also interviews in the paper. Where he bemoaned the challenges of making beer with icy water from a glacier and freezing cold weather. He was, by necessity, making cold fermented ale, or what is called alt beer. Alt is the German word for old, which mm. was the precursor to like the lager revolution. But he was using ale yeast, dark malts, and bohemian hops, yielding a quintessentially Alaskan take on an old favorite. All the people that were living here that wanted beer were really from the old country. It was a mining town, and uh, mm. so. So they wanted something that reminded them of home. Cheers. Cheers, guys. To a historic recipe. Winter ale is an old English ale, quite malty, a little sweet, and maybe some fruity character from the yeast. But what makes winter ale so unique is our use of spruce tips. Can I yep. eat them? Yes. They're, they're, you can eat them raw. Do you yeah, have it's... any lying around that we can try? <laughs> we can probably find some, yeah. Awesome. These are actually gathered locally, harvested not that long ago. And if you take a little bit in your hands, okay. rub it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they feel yeah. so good and they're right? like cool and like and I'm just on a forest floor. Like a fresh herbal sort of aromatic. And if you taste it, get a little bit of a kind of a gummy sweetness. It's not quite what you expect. What? What is that? It's almost like, what's well, like going to a forest and eating it. Captain Cook in 1778 on his voyage looking for the Northwest Passage used spruce as a component in making beer. Spruce tips are high in vitamin C, which helps prevent scurvy and preserve beer. Spruce tips have a really close oil fractioning similar to noble hops. And so for some reason, Captain Cook struck on something that was really pretty unique and, and I think iconic. And the smoked porter. It's the most award-winning beer in the Great American Beer Festival. We were you know, pretty much the vanguard of, of reenacting smoke as a character in beers. Get your nose in there and tell me what you smell. Whoa, just so smoky. Yeah, it's really <laughs> strong, right? It smells like bacon. Bacon right? is what it smells bacon like. Bacon is, yeah. right? You, when you think about it, smoke, it's in our DNA. That's how and we stay alive. Whether it be a smoking. campfire yeah. or the like. <laughs> 
where it's the safety from the saber tooth tiger right. or the like, mm -hmm. I, I really do think it has a real impact. Now, in beer, people don't expect it, but 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it was in beer because the malting process indelibly has that roasting character mm -hmm. that is important. As luck and history would have it. Across the street was a commercial smokehouse. So they struck up a neighborly deal, and now they roast their grains over alderwood. The preferred wood for smoking fish or cooking over the, uh, uh, a barbecue. And it's very distinctive and different. What would be maybe typical like of sherries or ports. We're all of a sudden kind of blossoming in this beer. Oxidation, producing nice, nutty, yeasty flavors. And the beer was aging. Like, it wasn't going bad. It was going good. It's the smoke. We were inspired again by history. So you start a brewery, get all the investors, you have the money. Never in a million years do we expect our bank to go under. There was a little bit of a downturn in the economy. So they held on to their nightly deposit. But the next day, everything seemed fine. We went by to go make our deposit. And it's a slot in the wall, a slot in the wall. And there's a sign on it that says, out of order. Now, how can a slot be out of order? So we went around the front of the building. Lights were all on. This is 11 o'clock at night. And there was a sign on the front of the door. that said, closed by FDIC. We could see all these people that we had been working with over the last couple of years. And they looked so down. I mean, it was just like such a bummer. And there was armed people in there. And officers stood there like that. <laughs> so, man, these guys look so miserable. Went across the street and bought two six-packs of beer and we just put them down in front of the door. The door opened and they went inside. Everybody in there so much appreciated that because their world was ending. They were being treated like criminals because they had to inventory everything. They had to take out all their personal stuff. They were allowed to make one phone call home to say, you're not coming home until this is finished. They didn't know if they had a job. And to have that one little bit of humanity come in the door and have these FDIC guys accept that and say, okay, at the end of this, you all can have a beer if you want. It was just like, that's the power of beer. We're many times put into situations where we have to do things differently. It's never a static place for us, but we embrace what we do. I think it's extraordinarily important for people to exhibit the passion and nurture the passion. I like the place, I like the people, I like the community, and I like beer.